At Brighton Grammar, we're all about ensuring our parents have a great understanding of what we're trying to do with their sons, particularly in the areas of academics and wellbeing. That's why for us, our three-cornered partnership between the home, the school, and the boys is fundamental in ensuring our parents move from participation, which is great, but to a much deeper understanding of what we're really trying to do with their sons, because we know if that occurs, when that occurs, the outcomes are much better for our boys. When I'm getting for, ready for school, my, my brother and my mum help me. So my brother does, um, he holds my bag to get it still and then I, I put my lunch box in and then my mum puts my morning tea in. I like my parents getting involved at school because then I can have a greater connection with the school and then we can talk about the school at home and I think they know what I'm doing and I know what I'm doing at school better. I think it's important that my family helps me with my learning because if you just learn at school, I don't think you learn as much as if you um, ask your parents as well because I read a lot and there's lots of words that I don't know what they mean so I nag my mum and dad so much that they get so paranoid about everything. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's very important for your school and your family to work together to support your learning and I think for the most part that definitely happens at Bride and Grandma because I mean at the end of the day both parties are there for you and they want you to get the best out of yourself and perform to the best of your ability and I think that is that can only happen when you've got a balance and when uh, both parties are working together um, and I think at, at Bride and Grandma that does happen. Yeah I reckon the support I get at home makes a huge difference with my learning because my grades have been not very good, but then as soon as I've got help, they've just improved. They've improved dramatically. My family can help me achieve my goals by just being that extra, you know, kind of um, column of support um, throughout my schooling life, especially in, you know, my final year. And, like, just if I need anything or somebody to fall back on and whatnot, they, they, they're always there to kind of support me through whatever it is, if I'm, however I'm feeling, if I'm sad or unhappy or struggling with a subject or whatnot, like they're definitely there to help me out and I really appreciate that. I think they'll choose something to do with equations and maths because they know I love maths a lot so they want me to do something that I would love to do because when they were young they really wanted to be doctors so do something that you love and then get a better and get you don't stress out as much and my family can help me achieve my goals by being a good, strong, positive influence on me and uh, really instilling the right values in you as more, of a, as more of a person than as a student and because that can carry over onto the sporting field and in your studies and I think if you have good, strong influence at home, um, you'll be able to implement that in everything you do at Brighton Grammar School and achieve the best of your ability. For those of you who weren't here on Tuesday, my name's Dr. Charlene Smith. I'm the General Manager of Projects and Collaboration at Aracy, and I'm thrilled to be emceeing this session this morning. Um, I am an Australian woman of mixed European descent. I was born on Bundjalung country, and I live and work on Ngunnawal land, and I'd like to pay my respects to the traditional custodians of the land we're meeting on this morning, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations, and thank them for their hospitality and their generosity in having us here on their country. So how fabulous was yesterday? Scale of one to 10, 11, 75. It was fabulous. I really had such an amazing time learning so much from our keynotes. I was humbled in the concurrent sessions by some of the beautiful, personal, vulnerable stories that were shared. And I really thank all of you for coming to this conference with your enthusiasm and your curiosity. And I have every confidence that today is going to be just as good. Um, and thank you to all of the keen tweeters who got us locally trending yesterday here in Melbourne at the morning plenary. Go team Twitter. <laughs> so the video we just played for you is the second of two student voice videos 
that um, the team at Aracy asked two of our local champions here in Melbourne if, um, if their schools could put together something that would put the child's voice at the centre of what we were doing here at the conference. And so we're so thankful to Brighton College and, uh, sorry, Brighton Grammar and Doveton College for providing us with those beautiful images of young people talking about what it means to them to have their parents involved in their education and engaged with their schooling. So just some quick housekeeping before we get into the serious business of the morning. Um, as you all should be aware, we have the lovely Larry who's been photographing us here at the conference, building a beautiful visual record of our time here together. But if for any reason you would prefer not to have your photograph taken, please see Danny at the registration desk in the, um, at the top of the stairs, just behind the room we're in now, and just let her know so that we can make sure that that doesn't happen. Um, we are absolutely delighted that so many delegates have been supported to attend this conference by the generosity of, the good, of good Start Early Learning and the Ian Potter Foundation. When we put out the call for um, anyone who was keen for a scholarship to attend the conference, we were overwhelmed by the volume and the quality of the applications that came in and we're so thrilled um, when the Ian Potter Foundation called up and said, would you like some more scholarships? So we were able to offer 10 more scholarships and um, have, uh, I think we have nine people all together here, uh, 19, sorry, people all together here on scholarships from the Good Start Early Learning and Ian Potter Foundation. Now I'd just like to ask our scholarship recipients just to stand up so we can applaud you. We're so thankful to Good Start and the Ian Potter Foundation for enabling several people who may not have otherwise been able to attend to be here at the conference and fully enjoy everything that all of us have had the privilege to enjoy. So thank you. Please be seated. So also, I think there's just a quick housekeeping slide. Is that right? Yes, so just to remind you all that our Twitter hashtag is PEConf17. Let's get, let's get trending again. Uh, you can see here the password to sign in for the conference Wi-Fi. Uh, following this session, we'll have morning tea and then the concurrent sessions will start again at 10.30. So at the end of this session, please clear out of here as quickly as you can so that the amazing venue staff who have been phenomenal for this whole conference can get the wall up in the middle so we can have our concurrence running on time. And I'd just like to recognise that this session is proudly supported by the Ian Potter Foundation. So our first speaker this morning is Dr Tim Moore. Tim is a Senior Research Fellow at the Centre for Community Child Health here in Melbourne. He's a leading thinker in Australia on child development, family functioning and service systems. Tim's team monitors, reviews and synthesises research literature on a wide range of related topics and he has been the principal writer on numerous reviews, reports and policy briefs and he's contributed a lot in my time at Aracy. I've been at Aracy for almost six years now and the name Dr Tim Moore pops up over and over and over again in um, the conferences that we attend, in the reports that we do and in the work that we do. Uh, Aracy has been proud to partner with the centre on numerous projects and we're really grateful to have Tim here this morning to share on authentic engagement, the nature and role of the relationship at the heart of effective practice. Please join me in welcoming Tim. Thank you very much, Charlie, for that warm welcome. Very daunting. Okay, no pressure whatsoever. Um, so my topic here today is authentic engagement. And um, I'm gonna start by saying that the professionals may seek to engage parents for many reasons. We might want to help individual parents with personal problems. Uh, we might want to help them support their children's learning, to help groups of parents manage shared issues. We might want to help communities of parents address common concerns regarding services and environments, or collaborate with parents in co-designing, co-managing and co-evaluating. So a whole raft of reasons. And to be successful at any of these, um, we need it depends upon the quality of the relationships that we establish. All of this work is relational. Now obviously this particular conference is focusing 
on how you help parents support their children's learning. But what I'm going to focus on is the process of engagement itself on what happens and what is central to engagement. The work that we do is essentially relational and um, we need to take on board exactly what that means. So what I'm going to look at is evidence regarding the role and nature of relationships, the neurobiology of interpersonal relations, key features of effective relationships, challenges in authentic engagement, and conclusions before I totally run out of time. There are lots of slides and lots of material in, the, in this presentation. Some of it we may need to skip through in order not to intrude upon Heather's time, um, but the full set of slides will be available to you on the ERACI website. Okay, role and nature of relationships. Um, why is this such an important aspect of what we do. There's a lot of work being done on the neurobiology of interpersonal relationships. That's some of the stuff I get to read and what I'm um, sharing with you is distilling some of this um, information. Matthew Lieberman says, our brains are designed to respond and be influenced by others. We are wired to be social. That's our biology, that's our our nature. The brain has a network um, that is devoted to mind reading others and we have an unparalleled ability to understand the actions of thoughts of um, those around us, enhancing our ability to stay connected and interact strategically. And when human beings experience threats or damage to these social bonds, the brain responds in much the same way as it responds to physical pain. That is, the same circuits in the brain are activated, indicating how important these bonds are to us. Um, so the notions of broken hearts and the like have some biological basis. So research on the neurobiology has shown that our brains constantly communicate with other brains through subconscious high-speed pathways and this enables us to register other people's feelings and enables them to register ours which is why we can't fake being interested caring or empathetic we are intensely social creatures our brains are shaped by relationships for good or evil and it's particularly true for children but relationships continue to play an important role right throughout our lives. So we've got two modes of thinking, two ways in which our brain operates. I'm going to start by just telling you a bit about um, this particular approach, which is from Daniel Kahneman, who won the Nobel Prize for Economics for work um, as a psychologist. And he talks about two ways in which the brain operates. System one, which operates automatically and quickly with no effort, no sense of voluntary control, generates the impressions and feelings um, that are the main source of our explicit beliefs. Um, that, and system two, which operates deliberately and slowly, is only um, used when the situation demands us and generates our sub... So system two is who we think we are. System one is actually doing most of the work. Um, and um, this lends itself to whimsical cartoons of this kind. System one racing ahead of system two. Mind you, it just reminds me of Dr. Seuss and <laughs> thing one and thing two. Um, our brains, um, this translates into um, interpersonal communication because our brains have two parallel ways for processing conscious and unconscious information. The first is the system one. It's a fast, uh, early evolving, fast system. It's for our senses, our motor movements and bodily processes that we share with other animals. It's non-verbal, inaccessible to conscious reflection. And we constantly communicate with other brains using that pathway. 
The second is the set of later evolving slower systems involved in conscious awareness, and this eventually gives rise to narratives, our, our, our ways we understand ourselves, imagination and abstract thought. And the difference in processing speed between these two pathways is half a second. Um, it takes 500 to 600 milliseconds, which is half a second, for brain activity to register in consciousness. But um, the, uh, the fast system processes sensory motor and emotional information in 10 to 50 milliseconds, which is virtually no time at all. So we've got half a second gap. During that time, our brains work like search engines. And it unconsciously scans our memories, our bodies, our emotions for relevant information, constructing our present experience based on a template from the part, and what we then see is what we think is objective reality. Whereas really our brains have been already processing as the fast system works incredibly fast. So that by, the time, by the time we become consciously aware of an experience, it's already been processed many times. Activated memories and initiated complex patterns of behaviour, responses in ourselves, responses to each other and to situations that we are in. 90% of the input to the cortex, your thinking brain, comes from this internal neural processing, not the outside world. So we're doing a whole lot of processing there using these uh, neurobiological and this has extreme importance in terms of our relationships with each other. Lou Cozzolino's accounts of this are probably as approachable as any. He says, like neurons, we send and receive messages across a synapse. You'll be familiar with the brain literature which tells us about how neurons connect with, with one another via synapses. They don't actually connect, they get close and they, they don't actually touch, the messages are transmitted um, through uh, in, um, hormones and the like. Um, Lou Cozzolino says the space between us is the same. We've got a gap between us, but we communicate across it. It's the space between us, it's the medium through which we are linked together into larger organisms, such as families, tribes, societies, and the whole human species as a whole. And because so much of this communication is automatic um, and below conscious awareness, most of it's invisible to us. We don't know that it's happening. So when we smile and wave and say hello, these behaviours are sent through the space between us via sight and sound and smell. And these electrical and mechanical messages are received by our senses converted into electrochemical signals within our nervous system, sent to our brains, and these generate chemical changes, electrical activation and new behaviours, and then back and forth it goes. So this is what's happening as we engage with one another. As we talk to one another, this is going on all the time. And that enables our brains to read the uh, body and facial signals, signals of others and to detect their um, intentions and their emotional states. They are recreated in us by virtue of the messages that we are getting that cross the social synapse. And these cues include facial expressions, pupil dilation, posture, tone of voice, odour, and the mirror systems in our brain, the mirror neurons that enable us to recreate those experiences. In And we don't know that it's happening. So if I can... Um, uh, demonstrate. I don't want to do this to you. Can you do a full facial up here, please? Um, can you get? Is it possible to get me up there? No. Okay. Uh, oh, there we go. That's awful. Sorry. <laughs> okay. So um, there, are, we've got um, dozens and dozens of muscles in our face uh, that cr that combine can create thousands of expressions. We don't have control over them. So if I smile at you like this, <laughs> then that is not something that evokes any kind of warmth in you or trust. And this is because I don't have conscious control of the muscles that convey a genuine smile. So you've got muscles here. 
that do the crinkling bit around your eyes. In order to um, activate those, I have to look at you really fondly. <laughs> and what happened is that a lot of you will find that you have automatically recreated that expression yourself in, in a minor way. We mimic. That's enough of that, thank you. <laughs> In effect, our right brains are able to communicate directly with other people's right brains, independently of conscious communication. That's what's going on. And the right brain limbic areas uh, that enable this grow rapidly in the first two years of life. So right brain growth is happening in the first two years of life, and that's when um, the exchange, the positive exchanges with parents are so important. Hard to get good pictures of this, that's not a pretty picture, but it shows the backwards and forth that goes on. Here's another attempt. This is two people facing each other. We were looking down on top and we're seeing a graphic representation of their brain activation as they imitate each other. It's right brain to right brain. That's what's going on all the time. Okay, so why is this important? It's important because it tells us that from a neurobiological, a biological point of view, that's who we are, that's how we operate. Um, and that the, um, the importance of these relationships for our um, mental state, our physical state, uh, and our ability to relate to one another depends upon these processes. And that means that relationships and engagement are central to anything that we do, including the work uh, that you are all doing um, and that we otherwise may take for granted. There has not in fact been much discussion that I have heard um, of the issue of engagement in terms of authentic engagement at the conference. We're concentrating instead on what you do and we're taking for granted something that's uh, fundamental uh, that um, uh, we really need to be paying attention to. So the evidence for the importance of relationships comes from a variety of sort sources. So the lessons from working with vulnerable families, we've got research on psychotherapy efficacy, research on effective help giving practices, research on family centred practice, family centred care, research on family partnership training, on community practice, co-design and co-production, whole series of areas, all of which are converging to tell us the same kind of message. I'm going to um, cherry pick some of these kinds of findings in order to illustrate uh, why these are important. Uh, this is one piece of work that we did um, a few years ago on engaging marginalised and vulnerable families. Um, and that was looking at the research on what families tell us about what they need from professionals, what makes them pay attention to professionals, what makes them uh, accept um, what professionals do, etc. And these are the things they say. They need services that help them feel valued and understood and that are non-judgmental and honest that have respect for their inher inherent human dignity and are responsive to their needs rather than being prescriptive. Allow them to feel in control and help them feel capable, competent and empowered. Are practical, help them meet their self-defined needs. Are timely, providing help when they need it, not weeks and months or years later and provide continuity of care. Parents value the sense of security that comes from having a long-term relationship. We could unpack all of those kinds of, and talk about them for ages, but my point here is that, um, that the majority of them are relationship related. They are to do with feeling valued and understood. That's not to do with what you're delivering. That's to do with who, who you are in your relationship with them. Um, respect for their human dignity, allowing them to feel in control. All of these are to do with the way that you interact with parents rather than whatever kind of wisdom you're trying to impart or whatever kind of program you've got, whatever you want them to do, the way that you interact with them. 
psychotherapy comes up with the same kind of message. Um, there are two main factors which tell us about the efficacy of psychotherapy or that are common to all approaches. All psychotherapy works with some people. None of it works with everyone. None of the, no methods of psychotherapy are really proven to be any better than any others. The thing that makes a difference are these. The therapeutic alliance, that is the joint working relationship between the therapist and the client and the personal qualities of the therapist themselves, not the method, not the content of what they're doing. Um, my favourite illustration of this comes from this particular study, psychiatrist effects in the pharmacological treatment of depression. So this is a randomised controlled trial of a drug and they were comparing, doing a standard kind of thing where they compare it with a uh, placebo um, and they found that the drug did work. However, who the patient saw made a bigger difference than the drug itself. Um, so 7 to 9% of the variability in the outcome was due to the psychiatrist. It was only 3.4% to the drug and some psychiatrists were consistently better than others. In fact, when they took the top third and compared it to the bottom third, they found that the top third did better with the placebo than the bottom third did with the real drug. You have to think about what that means. A drug is not meant to work in that kind of way. So there is the relationship. These authors conclude that we should consider the psychiatrist not only as a provider of treatment, also as a means of treatment. That's what we are. That's what you are. You are the means. You are a medium through which change occurs. The relationship is, provides that medium. Beliefs are also important, both professional and and per parental beliefs play an important mediating role in whether anything effective happens, whether any change occurs. The parent has to believe in the intervention plan. This is the placebo effect. You have to believe that this is going to work. That's what placebo means, I believe. Belief in personal ability to implement the intervention. The professional has to believe in the efficacy of the intervention and in the parent. So all of that, um, that, that, that puts us back on us. We have to not only believe in the effectiveness of what we've got to offer to the parent, we've also got to believe in the parent's ability to be able to carry it out. Parallel processes also operate. Relationships affect other relationships. Our capacity to relate to others is supported or undermined by the quality of our own support relationships. The flow-on effect can be seen in the relationships between early childhood professionals and parents of young kids. We model for parents how to relate to their young children by the way we relate to them. So our relationship, your relationship, with the parents that you want to work with really should have the same qualities as the, the, uh, the way that you want them to relate to their kids. You are modelling um, that. There is, there is a flow-through effect here. Relationships form a cascade of parallel processes, so the quality of relationships at one level shapes the quality of processes at another. People learn how to be with others by experiencing how others are with them. This is how your views and feelings of relationships are formed and how they can be modified. How parents are with babies or with their children this is how we want them to be. We want them to be warm, sensitive, responsive, consistent and available is as important as what they do. We need them to feed and change and soothe and protect and teach. Similarly, how professionals are, how we are with parents, respectful, attentive, consistent and available is as important as what we do. Inform, support, guide, refer and counsel. So modelling the characteristics um, is an important part of what we need to do. Overall, the evidence is clear. How services are delivered is as important as what is delivered. Outcomes are not simply the result of advice, take drug X or play with your child, but are determined also by the ways in which the advice is given. The manner in which support is provided, offered or procured influence whether the support 
has positive, neutral, or negative consequences. You can't have negative consequences. You can have the best program in the world. Um, deliver it in the wrong way and you will do harm. This is the, this is the message. Um, one thing that strikes me about this is, is that those two statements come from um, two different sources, um, from Carl Dunstan and his colleagues in the US and from Hilton Davis um, in the UK. Now, knowing both those um, guys, uh, they are totally different characters. They come from different intellectual traditions and they've come up with the same um, conclusions, which speaks to me about the, uh, the, the, the rightness of those conclusions and how um, important this is. Community-centred practice also has these same qualities. At the community level, engagement and partnering involve the relationship between a service system and the same principles and practices are effective in engaging and empowering communities at an individual level uh, are also effective at a community level. Um, and that's a recent piece of work that we've done um, for um, Child Family Community Australia. Um, okay, key features of effective relationships. Relationships have a dual function. They're both a means to an end and they're an end in themselves. They're a means to an end in the sense that although it's... Um, uh, that it's through relationships that children and adults learn, develop and change, but they're an end in themselves. They don't only lead to uh, a better quality of life, they are quality of life. They're, they're justifiable in themselves. Um, so relationships, they are the medium through which we transmit effective strategies to help families change the way that they relate to kids. This is the message. The relationship is the medium. It is a necessary but not sufficient condition. You have to have it first of all. If the parent doesn't feel they are listened to, then they will not listen to you. Um, parents seem to be disempowered um, in many cases. You seem to know a lot more. There's one way in which they are very powerful. They can take no notice of you. Um, and, um, and they will do that if they don't feel, if the relationship is not set up in a way in which they feel they can trust you and that you understand their circumstances. Having a positive relationship with a parent or parent is a necessary but not sufficient condition. You have to do something intentionally and purposefully to build parental capacities to provide their kids. So you, um, this is not saying that the content side of what you've got to offer is not important. It's saying that it doesn't come into play until you've got the relationship going. Then you can use that as the medium through which you can drive change. But you can't just have a relationship and everyone feels happy with the relationship and then think you've done your job. You still have to change. If the parent doesn't change in their capacity to support the kids learning, you haven't um, done your job. Engagement is a necessary but not sufficient condition for creating, creating change or for being an effective helper. It's the medium through which effective learning and change and programs can be delivered. There's a caveat. You can't treat the rela relationship simply as a means to an end. You can't fake an in interest in parents and their views because they'll know. And they'll know because of what we were sh talking about before. Because of that, the neurobiology and the way those messages come across, they will know, they will be taking in cues from the way that you say things, the way that you look at them, um, the way that you hold yourself and so on, to tell to what extent you are being sincerely interested in them. So although you may, we may think, well, I've got to be interested in the parent because if I'm not interested in them, then they won't listen to what I've got to say. If you do it like that, then you risk um, not being sincere. Research indicates that help receivers are especially able to see through help givers who act as if they care but don't. And help givers are given the impression that help receivers have meaningful and choices and decisions when they don't. Very important message. Instead, you have to treat the relationship as an end in its own right while being mindful of the ultimate goal. 
So this is what authentic parent engagement. Karen Mapp talked about that yesterday um, as important and uh, is very heartening um, to hear how strongly she stressed that. You have to somehow master the art of meta thinking or operating on two levels, that you are here, present in this moment with this person while being conscious of um, ultimate goal at the same time. Effective relationships have universal properties. This is my list of 10 qualities. Attunement and engagement, um, responsiveness, respect and authenticity, clear communication, managing breakdowns. All relationships break down, then that's not a disaster. Kids learn. Emotional openness, understanding others' feelings, empowerment and strength building, assertiveness and limit setting, and building coherent narratives. Challenges to authentic engagement. How to know and manage your own emotions and values. There will always be some parents in situations will find hard to understand and you'll have a reaction to. So understanding our default reaction <coughs> is important. You've got to learn to understand your own. And these reactions are part of your unconscious processes you need to learn how to manage them so they won't compromise your response. You can't get rid of them. They're just part of you. How to stay in the moment and manage distracting thoughts. Your mind goes the whole time. It's important to learn how to manage those thoughts so that they don't interrupt your attunement. Mindfulness strategies are good for this. How to let that, oh yes, I'm thinking about what I've got to do after this. Just let that thought go all the way through. How to maintain authenticity is uh, what we need to, um, our real feelings and intentions are being broadcast to other people. We need to be aware of that. How to build parental capa capacities, capabilities. Um, using strength-based practice is harder than it looks because our default mechanisms are to see, the f are to see faults in people rather than the positives. How, did not, how not to try and fix every problem. If you give people space, they will find um, answers to themselves. Check out this YouTube video if you've never seen it. It's not about the nail. Um, um, just Google, it's not about the nail, it comes up. How to know if you're engaging parents effectively. You've got to get feedback. You've got to constantly check back with parents. Is this still working for you? Is this still the way that you want to work? Is it still the most important thing that you uh, want? How to build genuine partnerships. Um, you need to trust the process and trust the person. These are powerful messages. And how to plan and design services with parents. Use co-design and co-production strategies. Best example I know are our Tasmanian Child and Family Centres and uh, my colleague uh, Paul Pritchard, after the break, will be giving a presentation on this, as will Lynn uh, Wiley Watson. There's a couple of presentations there about this work, which is uh, highly impressive. How to develop main and maintain skills. Relationship building is something that you can train yourself in. You can get better at it. Um, there's family partnership training, coaching training, motivational interviewing. Uh, I think Karen asked people yesterday how many of you, ha how many teachers here had received training in personal relationships. Uh, I don't think anyone answered that one. It is a skill. It is trainable and it is important. Um, and you also need to think about this as a lifelong learning kind of approach. How to reconcile relationship-based processes and evidence-based practice. Uh, we have a whole, there's a whole, I'm going to skip through this lot because we are running out of time. Um, we may get a chance to come back to it. This is some work that we've done um, for the Department of Health and Human Services locally. Um, Jill Callister on the first day mentioned the ro roadmap to reform. This is our answer for how you might deal with that. Can't tell you any of that. <laughs> Conclusions. She's, she's putting up notices to be telling me how long I've got. <laughs> <coughs> 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 
Okay, conclusions. Engaging and partnering families and communities are quintessentially relational processes whose success depends upon the nature and quality of the relationships. Without such relationships, there's a much reduced likelihood that our efforts to build parent capacity um, are being successful. The process of engaging is a necessary but not sufficient condition and needs to be complemented by evidence-based uh, approaches and building capa capabilities of parents. Uh, engagement and partnering are the medium through which interventions and to change behaviours are given. But we can't treat that merely as a stage to go through to achieve changes. We have to do it authentically with full take-up to occur. And the skills are well understood and tra trainable. Uh, parallel processes implies that we need to be supported by people who are modelling these things and we need to model these kinds of relational processes to the people that we work with. Um, while everyone agrees that relationships are an important aspect, this doesn't mean we, it doesn't mean that we must pay much attention to them. We need to approach this purposefully, not mindlessly or casually. This is work. This is an important part of what we do. We have to trust the process, have faith that engagement and partnership strategies will be productive, and we have to trust the person, have faith that the parents have the capacity to be valuable partners. If we do, if we do things to people, if we direct and control and have a covert agenda to change them, we'll get compliance or resistance, but we won't get any building of skills or resilience. If we do things for people, if we do charitable work, no expectation of them doing anything, we'll provide temporary relief. Again, we won't be building any skills or capabilities. If we do things with people, if we partner with them, if we share power with them, there'll be benefits for the parents who will build confidence, skills and self-reliance. If we do things with and through people, partnership with a shared agenda to promote child skills and participation, We'll get benefits for the children, family, creating positive environments for all. Thank you. Hurrying you along. Um, there's so much rich information in there, and it's. Um, I have just done biopsychology. Um, I'm doing my graduate diploma in psych at the moment, and it's really fascinating to hear those um, neurobiological lessons translated in such a relevant and applicable way to the, the work that we in this room do. So thank you so much for that. I am absolutely honoured and thrilled to introduce our next speaker. Dr. K Heather Weiss is the co-director of the Global Family Research Project, which is a new non-profit organisation building a worldwide platform and networks to exchange the latest thinking, research and innovations around how families, schools and community organisations can work together and ensure all children get the learning opportunities in and out of school that they need to succeed. Heather has a wealth of knowledge and experience as a thought leader and an advocate for family engagement and um, together with her colleagues she established the Family Involvement Network of Educators which was set up to provide the latest research, policy examples, professional development tools, evaluation, and other resources to support family and community engagement, practice and policy. Please join me in warmly welcoming Dr. Heather Weiss. Thank you. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm really pleased to be here. Um, turn to slide two here. Um, I want to thank um, Erasi for inviting me, um, the Smith family for the support that they've provided for this, and the Ian Potter Foundation for sponsoring this lecture, and it sounds like um, the, the possibility for um, people to be here. Um, I've been here since actually Monday night and um, did a workshop and have been watching sessions, going to keynotes, and it's very clear from the buzz in the hallways um, and the conversation in the sessions, dinner conversations, that you are building a vibrant, engaged, and innovative learning community in this first meeting 
um, that Arousey has put together. And you're here doing the work of family engagement um, and building the, the platform for that here, and I would also argue contributing globally. Um, I really needed my battery charged um, coming from the United States um, and more um, optimism in my optimism tank. Um, you've really um, filled my optimism tank. It's been great to meet new people, hear about new ideas, new practices, um, listen to sessions and keynotes, have conversations in the hall, even a few in the ladies' room. Um, so I think my bottom line is you know, coming from the situation that I come from um, and trying to build a global platform for family and community engagement, I come away thinking that, that many people are building that platform, um, including all of you in this room. So thank you um, for the work that you do and for my being able to be here. Um, the world's changing. Um, this is a cartoon that describes it. <laughs> There are many others. It's a new world, and that's, that's where I'm starting from in this. It's a new world, and my talk is really about how family and community engagement is going to help um, build that new world for kids and families. Um, this seems like a weird place to go. Um, this is the funeral procession of the king of Tonga. Um, Tonga is not too far from here. A friend of mine was in the Peace Corps there, and the king passed away, and she went to his um, funeral. This is the way some of the students who were waiting for the casket to go by were passing their time. Again, it's a new world. It's a new world of anywhere, anytime learning. So I want to take us um, traveling for just a minute. Um, I was in Brazil, uh, actually at a, at a national park, and met uh, a, an Australian woman and her mom. The woman worked for the Australian Embassy and we got to talking about family and community engagement and she mentioned a project that she and the American Embassy were supporting, small project, very rural Brazil. And they had put up, they had a big, big screen out in the community um, with activities for kids aligned with their curriculum and the rest of it, so a remote learning possibility for people in a remote place. And when they went to visit it, they realized that everybody in the community was there in the early evening watching um, the material. And the grandmothers, the parents, everybody. And they said, this is really about not just learning for kids, but there's opportunities, and obviously, for family and community engagement. They were there. They were learning. They then used that as a platform to provide some ways that families could, in fact, support their kids' learning and also some adult learning opportunities. So this is an example of where I think we're going, and that's to anywhere, any time learning and lifelong learning. I was in Cambodia a year or two ago, and with money from the World Bank, Cambodia is implementing early home visiting to families to build family and community partnerships for learning. The bank in many places realized that early childhood services alone without strong family and community engagement weren't getting them where they wanted to go. So in places like Cambodia, they're now experimenting, and they're literally experimenting with a random control trial on visits to families to, to provide the support information, the kinds of things that we do in family and community engagement. In Chile, um, there's a foundation, private uh, foundation, that has invested in creating a very powerful, um, well-evaluated family and community engagement initiative, starting in the kindergarten and moving on through the elementary years of school. It includes a lot of things around families can, how families can help their kids and support their learning and development, how they can partner with the teacher, and then how they can work with each other in a peer-to-peer in a um, learning and fun kind of way. I visited one of the schools that had this program, and one of the big things they told me about was a trip that they do twice a year with the moms or the dads if they're available, they're often not, into, into Sao Paulo to visit museums and other kinds of things. Those moms had never been to nearby Sao Paulo. Um, and from that, they began to build a pathway for themselves to go in and take their kids in to see some of the things in the city. Again, building pathways to anywhere, anytime learning. 
I was in China a couple of years ago speaking for a very high-end um, private school. Um, the people that are, can afford to send their kids there are very wealthy. They're working all the time. They don't have much engagement with their kids. The director of the school realized that was an issue. So she said part of the deal was that they had to come to the United States with their kids to a camp in the Adirondacks and go camping. The result of those two weeks were bonding, understanding their kids, understanding the ways they could support their kids. This is anywhere, anywhere, anytime, sort of lifelong learning in a very different kind of a, of a context. Um, there's new research, a lot of new research now, on what's um, called um, sort of joint media engagement, people looking at how we can use digital media to support interaction and learning. There's a new article out on Pokemon, which is a, a place-based mobile game um, that you go outside and find places and exercise and stuff. And what the report or the evaluation showed was that the parents valued playing together. It was more than Pokemon. It was playing together with their kids, having fun, um, bonding, and also um, co-learning. So the kids were teaching the parents some things, and the parents were teaching the kids some things. So part of our new um, landscape of learning, if you will, um, is the notion that we're having a lot more peer-to-peer, -peer, parents teaching children, but children teaching parents. Um, we have a leveler playing field, I think, than, than we've had in the past. So bottom line here is we're moving to a world where we're really now trying to build, I think, anywhere, anytime learning and lifelong learning. Um, I want to um, go to, I'm starting the Global Family Research Project and trying to understand where does family and community engagement fit in <clears throat> against a lot of our biggest global problems? And I've been thinking and reading a lot um, to try to understand those challenges and, again, where we fit. One of the people I turn to is Tom Friedman, um, who's a columnist for The Times, written many books. You may know his book, The World is Flat. He put one out late last year called Thank You for Being Late, How to Remain an Optimist in the Age of Acceleration. And he lays out three challenges, global warming, how we deal with diversity and inclusion in an increasingly diverse world where we need inclusion and to be able to work effectively with each other. And then the third challenge was the challenge of the ways in which digital media, the web, um, all of the phenomena, the bots, the uh, algorithms, all of the work that's, that's happening now, really changing the landscape of learning and of employment broadly. Um, are affecting um, the way we think about learning and education. And I want to give you the case of AT&T. Um, <clears throat> AT&T's business model changed with the supernova, changed dramatically. The CEO of the company realized that they needed workers with different skills and they needed a smaller, smarter workforce. So they made a deal. They said, if you stay and upgrade your skills, we will provide affordable degrees We'll give you up to $8,000 a year for courses, and we'll give you $30,000 across your lifetime here to continue to upgrade your skills. They did partnerships with Georgia Tech and some online learning platforms to tailor things so people were getting bachelors and masters as employees of AT&T. They developed a new social contract. You can be a lifelong employee if you're ready to be a lifelong learner. So it's in that spirit that I think a lot about this is the future. It isn't the future, it's right now. Anywhere, anytime learning and the need to be lifelong learners requires a learning mindset and the capacity to navigate these accelerating changes. I think this is what families and communities face and I believe family and community engagement is key in helping navigate these very important and life-changing changes. Family and community engagement, all of you, all of us, are on the front lines of some of the biggest global challenges. The transition to anywhere, anytime learning, the challenges of valuing diversity and building inclusion, and the challenge of reducing growing economic inequality and growing inequalities in learning opportunities. What's family and community engagement 2.0, 3.0 going to look like. 
my presentation is not going to give you the answer. There isn't one. 2.0 is being created now, and you're part of creating it. We're moving um, to design. I think we're beginning to put some of the contours of 3.0 together, and I think the presentation we just heard is a big part of that. So my presentation is engaged, is designed to get you thinking, talking, having ideas in the shower, um, seeing existing anywhere, running opportunities in your community, maybe helping to build some. Um, and I see you guys as players <coughs> in this, I see all of us as players in this new game. So what I'm gonna do is broaden the lens um, beyond family and community engagement in school <coughs> to say we need to now be thinking about thinking about it more broadly. It's not to say family engagement in school is not at the heart of this or a key part of it, it certainly is. But I want us to take a little time to broaden the lens and think about what the larger landscape of learning looks like, is becoming, and could be. Um, so I'm gonna start by redefining family engagement within that anywhere, anytime learning frame, lay out some of the key challenges and envision and describe some of the efforts people are making to address the, the challenges. Um, then I'm going to focus on really trying to find, I'm going to name two, but I'll bet you guys will find many others, high leverage opportunities to build family and community engagement pathways, learning pathways across time and place and communities with thick family engagement and learning for both kids and families and learning for kids and families together. So this is going to be a fast trip um, through a PowerPoint that's long. Um, uh, it'll be available as, as uh, the previous speakers was, um, so forgive me for, for zooming really quickly. Um, so th we're in the shift now to anywhere, anytime learning. We know there's lots of evidence from this from lots of places. Children and youth, in fact, all of us learn anywhere, anytime, not just in school. We have a broad ecology of learning. Um, you guys can fill in lots of other circles. People are inventing them and connecting them as we speak. School is important. Healthcare, social service, after school programs, museums, libraries, higher ed, families. Think for a minute about all the places you learn, all the places in your community um, where people learn. We have a broad learning ecology, and I think as family and community folks, we, we are beginning to build links among those things to build out this broader anywhere, anytime learning ecology and build pathways. So we, with Karen Mapp and others in a working group on family and community engagement a few years ago, developed a new kind of operating definition for family engagement. It's all the things families do to support children's learning and development from birth on, anywhere, anytime. We built out family engagement as a shared responsibility. It's not just the responsibility of families, it's the responsibility of communities to support that family engagement. It's a shared responsibility. In Tim's terms, it's a relationship, and we both have responsibility for that, both as individuals and as organizations and as communities. Family engagement happens across settings, excuse me, and it happens continuously over time. So on Tuesday, I did a design thinking workshop um, with a wonderful group of people to think about how to build anywhere, anytime learning um, and connections amongst all the places children learn as part of the transition to school. So that the transition wouldn't just be to school, it would be to, with families, connecting to all of the, or many of the places you saw on that set of circles as part of the transition to school. And with design thinking, and our, my slides will be up with lots of resources if you're interested in this, with design thinking, which is kind of a co-design, bringing diverse perspectives together to converge on an idea, um, people in the group put together different prototypes, and they have to be things you make, draw, make, or whatever, of what um, it would look like. This was one of them, and if you look, I don't know if you can see, but in the upper left-hand corner, it says, this is a place for adults to learn. And over in the right-hand corner is the coffee pot with both decaf and regular coffee. I point this out because you can see the kids, but there's also in space there a space there for adult learning, lifelong learning, and a commitment to that. The big welcome sign banner. This is the kind of sort of visualization people were doing of what this would look like. So come on. Um, uh, 
come in. You see a welcome. So there, this was an attempt to create a welcoming place for families to work with their kids, but also for some learning on their own. So we're visualizing, we're co-designing. So 40 years of research tell us family engagement is a very powerful predictor of school and life success. So when you think of yourselves, think of yourselves as working in, in your community, in your country, and globally to help one of the most powerful forces, if not the most powerful force in kids' lives um, prosper. You are the people that are helping the families that are so important to kids. You saw the testimony from the kids. I can give you years of research that testify to the same thing. You're in that very powerful position of helping to shape it. We know family engagement is important anywhere, anytime, not only in school, but in all those places. It's critical for helping all children and families access all learning opportunities from birth through secondary school and beyond. I'm just reading a business plan for my 30-year-old daughter, a 33-year-old daughter, continues if you're lucky. It's not an event, an ongoing process, and we know it's lower for families impacted by income, racial, and ethnic inequities and immigrant status. So I want you guys to think of yourselves um, as you are. Um, again, I mentioned I've been looking for guidance myself um, on what it means to be global and what it means to try to be part of global leadership in family and community engagement. And I came on this book, which I highly recommend. Um, it's by a, a professor who's part of the team at the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard, really looking at a different kind of leadership, the kind of leadership we need now. Um, and when I read the book, I read it for myself and thought about it, I thought, this is what people in family and community engagement are doing. We are crossing boundaries, building bridges, and leading change. So quoting from the book, in crossing boundaries, you must get groups, often with big differences and competing cultural narratives, to come together to appreciate the systemic nature of the problem, build a relational bridge, and adjust their values, practices, and priorities on behalf of adaptive change. That's what you're doing. That's what family and community engagement is, and it's going to be even more important to bring the skills you have to bear as we try to build this anywhere, anytime, and lifelong learning. So as leaders, I think we also have to deal with, and this is American data, I assume something like this must exist here, on the equity gap in anywhere, anytime learning. So if we open the lens beyond school, we see the difference um, between the more economically advantaged and the economically disadvantaged in terms of access to key anywhere, anytime learning resources. Um, the parents um, of the more, uh, the more economically advantaged parents are spending 220 hours more in reading and the kind, those kinds of things. The kids are getting access to preschool. They're getting access to after school and extracurricular activities, summer learning, field trips. That all adds up to 6, 000, a 6,000 hour learning gap, basically between the rich and the poor. So we have to be paying attention as we build anywhere, anytime, and lifelong learning to equity. This is data from the United States on, again, by economic status, spending on enrichment. This has now come up at the policy level, risen to the policy level, at least in some places in the United States, um, that, that it is the non-school learning opportunities that are a big part of the achievement gap, the education achievement gap in the United States. And people are recognizing it's the capacity to, to make sure everybody gets the things I showed you on the previous slide that are in fact going to lead to better learning outcomes for everybody. So think about things in terms of time. We have six, the kids have 6,000 hours of wake time. About 1,000 hours are spent in school. That's 5,000 available hours to impact, educate, and enhance the learning of kids. Huge amount of time is out of school. What are we doing with that time? That's the anywhere, anytime learning time that you guys, I think, um, have huge contributions to make in terms of your knowledge and skills and acquainting families with these kinds of things, but also helping within communities to build bridges across learning experiences with thick family engagement um, around the community. Um, 
this vision, and we're sort of working on it at the project, is beginning to think about pathways, pathways that begin for families with early home visiting programs and other kinds of things, early childhood classes that engage families, after school programs, STEM, teen clubs, it's a pathway. And when we envision this with some of the, the work we're doing now to try to literally draw it, you've got these kinds of opportunities for kids. You've got community organizations linking together to create these learning pathways. And there's a sheath of thick family engagement around it. So I en encourage you to think and visualize what you think it looks like. This is, again, look like. This was from a uh, design thinking thing we did in Karen's PPE a year or two ago, asking people to think about the transition to school as more than just school and visualize it. So you have the school in the center, but then you have a huge array of other places. And what they did in their idea was to link it together with this passport to kindergarten. And families and kids would go to each of these places, the park, the library, other places, remember, for anywhere, anytime learning in the community and check off their, get a stamp in their passport and turn that in for free books and other kinds of things. So part of this is imagining what this is all gonna look like and creating it. So I'm urging you to imagine and create. This is anywhere, anytime learning on the subway. Um, President Obama put money into the early learning challenge to try to do really innovative things in, in early learning with an emphasis on family engagement. This came out of a grant to the state of Massachusetts that brought the early childhood people, after school people, our Mass Bay Transportation Association or Authority and other people together and resulted in things like building your brain on the train, parent engagement activities on the subway on the way to work. Um, again, using imagination. This is from Cape Town, uh, South Africa, or actually uh, Johannesburg, South Africa. The library there came up with the idea of putting books and a librarian in the laundromat where there are lots of kids and families. Again, go where the kids and families are as you build the anywhere, anytime learning pathway. Go to them, think about where they are. This is an amazing project um, in New York City. This is going beyond the usual suspects to build bridges among community learning settings. The Pinkerton Foundation, with the library as the anchor institution, has put together a third grade through sixth grade literacy pathway. It begins with family engagement in, in, uh, and early childhood and literacy activities with extensive family engagement, the kinds of things I suspect a lot of you are doing. Um, continues on in the transition to school. When kids get to school, um, the, the school is working on literacy and engaging families around it. After school programs are working on literacy and the older kids in after school are mentoring the younger kids and older people in the community are coming in to contribute in after school and in other organizations with the community to enrich the literacy skills of the kids to create this pathway. Their goal, in, and the school is heavily involved in this, but it's all these other parts that are coming together, it literally linked together intentionally to make sure that by fifth grade, every child in a set of schools in some of the poorest parts of New York are in fact literate and, and able to succeed um, with that literacy. So we look a lot at what families say. We need information. This is a, a picture of a, a researcher at Harvard, an amazing man um, who is a behavioral economist, one of the pioneers in behavioral economics. Um, and he talks about bandwidth. It goes back to the neuroscience and the fact that you know, with all the things that families and all of us are trying to do, sometimes we have a narrower bandwidth. And that means, yet again, that we need to be providing accessible, understandable, and actionable information to families. Um, again, meeting them where they are, which is you know, stressed with, with less time than we would like. So this is an example of doing that. Um, and again, as part of the transition to school. In Cambridge, where I live, there's a family council. And they you know, engage families in a variety of ways and do a lot of the policy planning, connecting, and building the family engagement pathways within the city of Cambridge. So a parent came to that group and said, look, you, know, you guys talk about the transition to school, but it isn't just a transition to school. I need childcare. You know, I work. It's a transition to after school. What can you do to help me? So what they did was they got a group of parents together, early childhood providers, um, teachers and folks from the schools, and also um, after school folks, to come up with this four-page brochure 
which is the, included as part of the transition to, um, to school, about after school. It talks about the importance of after school, what to look for to find a good one, where you find good ones in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and how you can maybe get some subsidies to help you get there. So again, this is a reframing away from family engagement and the transition to school to say, this is about creating a pathway. Now in doing this, people that had not worked together in the organizations that put this together built relationships and had been doing other similar kinds of things. So it had impact for parents. It also had impact um, in terms of creating relationships in the community. This is another really good example um, of a pathway. Um, this is done by New Visions um, in New York. The uh, head of New Visions until a year ago, or a year ago, left New Visions to become in charge of all of the work on education at the Gates Foundation. And I'm hoping he will bring this kind of thinking um, to Gates. This is, so New Visions it was a, is a school support organization in New York, works with schools. Um, their goal is to have every kid graduate high school and be on the path to some kind of post-secondary education. Then they put together a pathway approach to get there with parent involvement as a key part of it. So if you look at this, you'll see on the left the benefits for teachers. Understand that if the, with the benefits of family engagement, this is a family engagement pathway to keep kids on the pathway through school and into college or some kind of post-secondary training. The teachers will understand uh, college readiness benchmarks um, and positive interaction with parents and students, feeling supported by parents, all those kinds of things. So again, here's the benefits for the teachers. Here's the benefits for the parents. Understand college readiness benchmarks. Uh, better able to monitor students' progress and to support their college and career aspirations. Collaborate with teachers. You can see them. Benefits for students. Then the school level capacity building, the parents, students, supports, and resources. This is an amazing configuration of things that puts family and community engagement as a key component of that pathway. Now, this is their data dashboard. This is their, their visual New Visions tracker. Couple of key indicators, a parent can they get, get this regularly, a parent can look at it. Green is obviously things are going pretty well. Yellow is there may be a problem. So I as a parent get a sense of is my kid going to school? Are they taking the courses and passing them? Um, et cetera. Again, great way if we think about what parents need, information in a, in a accessible, comprehensible, and actionable format. This stuff is coming out regularly. If the kid is missing school, you know it. You've got the chance to do something about it and the resources to help you do it. On the back, and this is one thing I love, on the lower um, right, it says, this young person to stay on track needs to do some things. On some of these things, it will talk about not just credit uh, recovery kinds of programs, but also after school activities that build their skills. So this is a, an ongoing thing where we're not just school-centric. We're saying what else outside the school is going to be available to help the kids stay on track. So we look for high leverage family and community engagement opportunities to build family and community engagement. And we centered on the transition to school in our work. Our website is full of resources on this around family and community engagement. So we've reframed the transition as a shared responsibility among families, early childhood programs, schools, after school providers, and many other organizations in the community. You saw them previously in that map with the passport. It's a move not just into school, but into different learning settings in and out of school. Different learning settings in and out of school. You can support your child's development and learning in and out of school. It's a process, not just a one-time event. Um, it's an opportunity to build strong and continuing family and community engagement pathways to support children's learning in and out of school. Transitions are a moment where people pay attention. They do what new visions on the transition into high school. They do in the entry to school. This is a time when people will come together to create and do new things and create those kinds of pathways. And they're key opportunities for building and strengthening family and community engagement. We know the transition's a matter of equity, um, and you saw my equity chart. We need to be helping people transition not just to school, but to being able to access all those other learning opportunities. Families are key. There's data, much data, um, much research that shows kids whose families are engaged around the transition do better in school. 
um, transition beginning not just in the moment of walking in the school door, but a year or two before and continuing on into early elementary school. It's all about relationships, Tim's point, among families, early childhood providers, schools, and communities. And the smooth transition really makes a difference for kids' learning and development. So we're trying to move in our thinking, again, from a school-centric framework to an anywhere, anytime learning framework. From school and readiness focused, a lot of transition is on school and readiness. Institution-centered, school, um, and siloed, um, it's the school. To a focus beyond the school, the child, and the curriculum, a user human-centered approach where people are helping to co-create the transition and where it's integrated and focused again on anywhere, anytime learning pathways. So we put together um, for, for uh, a number of uh, groups, but including the PPEs that um, Harvard does, um, a design thinking exercise that allows you with design thinking to harness diversity and build inclusion. Design thinking is a process of bringing diverse people together to collectively generate and poten uh, and new and potentially more effective user-centered ideas and solutions. Tim had it on his list. It's, this is penetrating everything. It's in the leadership, global leadership book I showed you. Companies are using it. This whole user-centered approach, start where they are, engage them, not just to hear what they want, but also in the design process, is beginning to really um, change the way uh, we do business in, in lots of different pl places. Um, so we challenged the group here, um, as we do typically, to build a prototype, come up, put out a bunch of ideas on the table, center on one you think will work, and then build a prototype of it. Your prototype has to engage all types of families, include coordination among diverse stakeholders, build new or existing pathways across time, and go beyond the usual suspect. Um, that's where we get um, people bringing in the barbershop and the beauticians as a stop on the, on the transition to school. Barbershops and beauticians enlisted to put out books and talk to folks about kindergarten registration. Again, really amazing creative ideas come to play. This is our group um, the other day that came up. One of the prototypes was the little class or the little school model you saw. The one in the middle um, with the yellow triangles is a is a good food pathway. They riffed off the idea of creating a pathway around the community to create um, awareness of nutrition and help fill lunch boxes with nutritious food. And you even use the supermarket with kids to count things, to number, you know, to read, et cetera, et cetera. So thinking of food broadly and a food pathway as part of the transition. There were a lot of very clever ideas. When I get home, I have my notes about them. I'm going to write them up and blog about them. Um, last uh, place we're looking now is public libraries. Um, this is a publication we just did. We did a call to action with the Public Library Association in the United States last year, calling them to continue and to enrich and build um, their family and community engagement within libraries. This is an idea book that just came out that lays out a framework I'll show you and has many, many ideas, really innovative, interesting ideas of things libraries are doing within the library, ways they are reaching out to engage other partners in the community. Again, they are committed not only to bringing families into the library, but helping connect themselves and connect families to all kinds of learning opportunities, including schools. Why libraries matter? I keep pushing on equity. Equity is real important. Um, they matter, this is data that suggests or shows that families who are from low-income homes use the library at a high rate compared to other community spaces. Um, I don't know if that's true here, it's true in the United States. Um, so you can see, beyond attending a religious event, the second most frequent thing was the library. They are a place where fee people often feel comfortable going um, and where they will get the resources they need, both for themselves and for their kids. Librarians are interested, we did a big national survey of what libraries are doing and what librarians are interested in. The top three family engagement interests are making the library a welcoming and safe space for families. Goes back to that prototype you saw that we built on Tuesday. Creating welcoming spaces for everybody, safe and welcoming spaces. They're particularly safe for new immigrant families with the challenges they're facing. Help families feel confident in supporting their children's learning and development and support them in technology use. We did, um, we have many frameworks. I, I love Karen's framework. Um, we, when we build frameworks, we try to think about how do we align our framework with other people's frameworks. So you'll see a lot of what Karen has done here in this framework. 
you know, we built a framework for the National Head Start Family and Community Engagement uh, effort. There's a lot of that in this. So I think to the extent that we can in the family and community engagement space, building frameworks, but having key themes that run across all of them um, is important. So I won't go through this except to say, um, take a look at it if you're interested in it. Um, it really does lay out what families will do, or libraries will do in that, in that below the circles. And it's all the kinds of things we talk about in family and community engagement. We're seeing libraries reach out to family and community community engagement folks um, for advice on um, folks you know, in this room about how do we better engage families. So I want to end by saying um, you guys are leaders. Create possibility. Start imagining. Start connecting. Start building um, anywhere, anytime learning. Build your professional capacity. You've heard a lot about that. Um, secure resources and then the, you know, the, the try it. See if it works. If it doesn't, try it again, the kind of cycle that we all talk about. This is the last slide from our workshop. Um, this was at, after we'd all done our prototypes and we were debriefing on how it worked, how we could do it better, et cetera. Um, one woman, who I hope is here, uh, two women actually put together this. It's called, you know what? This is not rocket science. We can do it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>
Dr. Wise, um, Sharon is my name. And so oh, people, I, I just, I can't hear the question. Thank you. I'm sorry. Um, our Parent Tech campaign is based on um, design thinking. Just wanting to ask you um, a question around it. Um, we're obviously trying to invite everyone to a conversation to actually then keep building prototypes for the future. Um, it's a rel relatively new concept to try in Australia. Could you give us some pointers as to some things and tracks and tips that we might be able to do um, through this? Yes, yeah, so Heather, the question was around are there any tips for how we could get on the design thinking road? Okay. Um, um, I, I, think, I think be careful. Um, uh, I put together a resource list um, that you know you guys have, and I'm, you can well going to put it on your website. But the thing I think some of the things that I found um, most helpful are a set of materials that are available from the D School at Stanford um, that are informed by Oakland's Educational Equity Project, um, and it's around how to be um, mindful um, in design thinking. Um, so it puts, a, it takes the typical set of steps in design thinking of empathy and, um, and through to prototyping and testing something and puts a front and a back on it. And I really, I really um, encourage people to take a look at these. Um, and it's about your own um, privilege um, and how you work effectively with other people. Um, so uh, it's a huge amount about self-awareness and about if you're going to bring diverse groups together, recognizing yourself, some of the things that Tim talked about, recognizing yourself, and it, actually it's a lot of what Tim talked about, as you go into a design thinking process where people, you're deliberately bringing diversity, diversity in all kinds of ways together um, to then build a product, you know, solve a big problem and whatever. So I think as I've gotten deeper into design thinking, I'm looking for those kinds of tools that help me not treat this in a glib way, it's just a fun exercise, number one. And these are some of the tools that are available on the D-School's website that really get you thinking long and hard about what you're doing. And then the second thing is to think about it um, in multiple ways. It can be kind of a one-off. Um, one of the uses of this uh, by a graduate student uh, at Harvard not too long ago was to help San Diego, the superintendent in San Diego, California, build a new design thinking or build a new family engagement thing. They did a design thinking exercise with families from six different language groups working on design thinking in a fishbowl with teachers watching them talk about what they wanted and what they hoped for and what they would design. And it transformed the teachers' understandings of the family and led to some things that the, that the schools and the superintendents said we could actually take as ideas and build on. So that's a simple example of how you can build it to, to build cross-understanding in, in groups. So other people are beginning to use it in a way to really talk about going from designing the idea to prototyping it and to actually trying it out and keeping everybody that designed it engaged through the whole process, which is a much more rigorous and complex use of it. So it's got multiple purposes, but I think take a look at the, some of the resources I put together that show how it's been used in family and community engagement, but then some of the deeper resources at the top about how we use this um, with the kind of respect and I think some of the kinds of characteristics that Tim laid out. Thanks so much, Heather. Let's thank Heather and Tim for their contribution this morning. Now, I can sense that you're all ready for morning tea, so just before I let you go, I'd like to once again thank the Ian Potter Foundation for their support of this session. Um, and just two quick announcements. One of our concurrent speakers, Rachel Elphick from AFL Cape York House, will be giving an encore of her paper more than just a welcome mat at lunchtime downstairs in the element room for anyone who would like to catch that um, very well received paper. So that will be at lunchtime in the element room. I've also had a lovely request that those of you who've traveled here from Western Australia, if during morning tea, if you could gather just kind of to the 
just outside the doors at the back here. Um, someone would like to have a photo opportunity with all the Western Australian delegates, so please, just straight after this, if you could gather just outside the doors, that would be terrific. And please, if we could move out quite quickly so that they can bump this in for the next session. Thank you so much.